So you may know that the Health Collaborative conducts a uh, um, community health needs assessment every three years to assess the needs of the community, basically to find out about the diabetes rates, the poverty rates, uh, suicide, anything you want to know about the county in terms of health. That's what this research does. And we recently found out in 2016 some of those results. And we found out, for example, um, that there is a 20-year there's a 20-year difference in life expectancy whether you live in the north of San Antonio versus the south. Um, so we want to talk about that because there are several factors that may explain this difference in life expectancy, and those factors are what we call social determinants of health. Okay, so factors that determine the health, and those are really the conditions where people grow, uh, play, live, work, and age. So by that, those conditions, we mean the schools in our neighborhoods, we mean our workplaces, we mean our churches, like this one, uh, we mean our parks and our homes. And so all those different contexts have an impact on our health. We're also referring to the social environment, so it's the quality of our education, employment, income, social support, public safety, so all these things that they talk about at City Council really impact our health. So with this in mind, that's the framework that we're going to have today's discussion, that health is in all policies that they talk about at City Council. For example, a transportation decision about improving our bus system, that can really provide greater access to food, to community resources, and even health care services to the residents. A community development plan about neighborhood improvements, for example, can have a direct impact on uh, providing accessible, stable, and affordable housing to some of our residents. And an economic development decision can have a critical impact also on our workforce. So every decision, I keep repeating it, but every decision that City Council makes does affect our health. And so the future District 7 City Council women or Council men will be representing the health of the 137,000 residents in the district. So to proceed, I would first like you to uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us why health is important. Sure. First, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Ana Sandoval, and I'm a candidate for City Council in District 7. And I want to thank all of you who took the time to be here tonight. Uh, obviously, your your city government is important to you, but so is the health of your community. And thank you for taking the opportunity to, uh, to hear me out, um, or the other candidates, had they been here, on, on our positions on community health. Health. Um, so, like I said, my name is Ana Sandoval. I grew up here in uh, San Antonio, down the street, actually, on Donaldson Avenue. And for several years, I worked in the field of air pollution control. Uh, so protecting public health from, uh, from large pollution sources, small pollution sources, uh, from you know how development uh, occurred in a community also uh, determined what air quality we had and ultimately what health impacts we had. So after many years of doing that, um, I worked in, in planning, I worked in community relations, and uh, as part of, of running the, off, uh, the chief of staff of the executive officer there. But after many years of doing that, I decided to go back to school and study public health. And I was specifically interested in uh, the health impacts of air quality on the body. I wanted to know every detail I could about the physiology, and I wanted to know um, about environmental epidemiology, how diseases that are influenced by our environment are prevalent in the population. Where do they occur? In what types of populations do they occur? Um, is it in older people? Is it in younger people? Geographically, where are they? So I spent uh, two years of my life uh, with 
lots of computers and lots of books and lots of libraries uh, delving into that field and came out learning a lot more uh, than I had expected to, including um, what Dr. Bergeron just mentioned is the social determinants of health, how really everything in our environment, um, you know, our community, our, our social pressures, the education we have access to, the built environment we have access to, how all of these things influence public health. So I know that if I become an elected official, the decisions that we make on council will also affect public health. And I want to make sure that my decisions are helpful to public health, because if we don't have our health, what do we have? So thank you. Thank you. So I'll we'll start with another question. So as you know, community health and wellness is not really a priority at City Hall. Um, it ranks as lower than streets in terms of a survey that was conducted by Speak Up San Antonio. Um, yet it impacts our well-being, workforce, economic development, everything we've been talking about. So what health-related areas do you think deserve increased attention, priority, and local resources? And if elected, how would you elevate the discussion of these health issues at City Hall and lead effective action to improve health and health care in our community? Um, okay, that's a, can everyone hear me okay? Um, that's a great question. So the city of San Antonio just hired a director for the Metro Health Department uh, in the past few weeks. This is a position that had been vacant for approximately two years. We are a city of over a million individuals, 1.4 million. Uh, having a vacancy in that type of position for two years to me also indicates uh, that that maybe public health is not a priority to the city. So I, you know, if I'm on council, I want to make sure we don't go through periods like that again, where we have two years without a leader in, in that position. Number two, the budget for the Department of Metro Health uh, has shrunken over time, and it certainly hasn't kept up with the pace of the growth in our population. So to me, that's another way in which we can prioritize public health is making sure that our public health department has the resources to deal with our growing population. Number three, the city council has a number of committees where they actually roll up their sleeves and delve into policies uh, at the detailed level. So we have something called the transportation and the utilities committee. We have a housing committee, uh, neighborhoods committee. We don't have a health and human services committee. And I think if we are serious about improving public health in San Antonio, we should consider having a committee like that at the policy policy level uh, with elected officials on it, someone who's accountable making those decisions, someone that you can vote in or out <laughs> making those decisions. And uh, lastly, I would say now that we do have our Metro Health Director on board, I think it's a perfect time uh, to work with Metro Health and see how how that department would feel about having a citizens advisory committee uh, assist them in their work. So those are some of the some of the ideas I've had so far about how we can uh, push to improve public health in our community. Thank you. Next question. Bear County is the primary source of funding for indigent health care in our area through the Bear County Hospital District and University Health System. How would you, if elected, promote cooperative efforts to increase services and access to care for the residents of San Antonio? Um, so, like you mentioned, it's actually the county that works on uh, indigent health, not the city at this point in time. So some people might say we don't need to worry about it if that's in the county's hands, but the truth is, A, any of us could become indigent at some point in time and, and it will affect us, but B, the funding that the county receives is, is taxes, it's property taxes that we all pay and we definitely want to see them used uh, wisely and efficiently. So how can we how can we do that? Uh, I think we have a lot of great organizations in the area doing good work. We have uh, community health clinics 
And as of a few years ago, uh, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we saw a rise in the number of clinics called federally qualified health centers that do um, more comprehensive health services. So it's not just you and one doctor, but maybe you and uh, the, uh, the additional social services that you might need to keep your health um, up to I was going to say up to code. Uh, I've obviously attended too many forums <laughs> to, to keep your health uh, in check. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, as a city, what we can do is uh, work with the many uh, nonprofit organizations that we have, the philanthropic organizations that we have in town, as well as those clinics that we're talking about, and see where we have gaps and maybe where we have overlaps in service, and that will help our dollars, our tax dollars, and our philanthropic dollars go a lot further in caring for individuals that need help. Third question, the disparity in health between our poorest and our wealthiest zip codes or districts is quite striking. So that also relates to the 20 year difference in life expectancy that I was talking about. So how would you, if elected, reduce health disparities and improve health outcomes for our lower income communities and residents? Um, Sure. So this is one of those subjects, health disparities is one of those subjects that I studied in school and I had not expected to study it. I thought, oh, I'm just going to go learn about environmental stuff and how that, how that affects health. Um, but I took this course called Society and Health and really it, it just paints such a broad picture about what, uh, what affects our health. So it's not just um, the decisions that, that you make, you know, whether you decide to work out or not work out or whether you decide to, to eat healthy or, or get your checkup, but there are so many uh, other factors in life that influence them. So I do have to say I went back and I looked at some notes before today's interview, and I'm going to look at those notes now and read, read those things aloud. <laughs> um, so there, there are uh, factors called determinants of health, and so... so this disparity that we see in health is influenced by, by the determinants of health, our economic stability, the education that we have access to, the social context, you know, what's, what's acceptable where, where you live and in the community where you are, what's, you know, what's frowned upon, um, as well as, of course, what access, what healthcare access you have, but also what built environment is like around you if you have, as you were mentioning, you know, access to, um, to a place where you can have active transportation, so bike lanes or, or sidewalks. So I think the best thing we can do as policymakers on the council is look at what are these things that influence health? How are they different in the north, north of Hildebrand and south of Hildebrand, where that disparity line is? And and try to improve the conditions south of Hildebrand so that we do have a great built environment, great uh, education and economic opportunities, as well as access to healthcare. So I would, I guess I would go upstream of just you and your doctor, but I would go uh, and try to address those things that influence, you know, whether or not you end up going to your doctor's office. Does, is that? That answers the question. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, speaking about who goes to the doctor or not, though, um, so as you know, there are high incidences of obesity and diabetes here, and we're actually ranked as the second in the nation for obesity. Um, past city efforts attempting to improve these rates, uh, such as trying to reduce the prevalence of sugary drinks in the community, uh, have been met with a lot of controversy. So what ideas do you have to to reduce the incidence of these chronic health issues here in District 7 and in the city. <laughs> Diabetes is a big topic, so I know I made some notes about it here. Um, so I can't find them. Uh, so. So we have, like you said, second in the nation uh, diabetes rate. 
um, obesity, and uh, that's about that's over one fourth of the adults in San Antonio or, or Bear County suffer from obesity. Um, there are already uh, if you're if you work in the health field, you know that there are a number of programs out there that that help people with uh, with obesity or managing diabetes, um, and it's great that they're there. I do think we want to convene and and um, apply something like the, if anyone's heard of the collective impact model, where you bring together organizations that are all working on the same area and you build on the strengths that they have and see, like I mentioned before, where the gaps are and, and uh, try to address those. Are uh, you familiar with the Diabetes Collaborative? Oh, well, that's exactly <laughs> the kind of thing that we would, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we could invite you on that. Great. Um, I would also um, want to stress just how significant diabetes is in our community. I've lived in other places, and you can go uh, months without meeting someone with diabetes. But in San Antonio, all of us know someone with diabetes, and it, all of us probably know many people that, that suffer with diabetes. And I think it really needs to come more to um, more to the forefront. Uh, diabetes is uh, it's a life changing disease for people who suffer from it. And if you have some of the more severe consequences, it also becomes a life changing disease for your family members because they will have to care for you. And if you are unfortunate enough to to be so ill that you have to take disability, then that becomes that begins to affect your employer. And uh, given the prevalence that we have in our community, that means a lot of employers are actually affected by people suffering from diabetes, and that becomes a broader economic impact to our whole community. So, you know, if we don't have healthy people, we can't have a healthy workforce. And uh, and we really shortchange our community on that. Thank you. OK. Like this. Thank you. OK. Um, so other than and the, the collective impact model to address diabetes, so how how do you think we could try to decrease incidences of chronic diseases? Right. So, so you, we know that chronic diseases are. We're talking about heart disease. We're talking about diabetes and obesity. Well, you don't want to focus on the disease itself, but all the things that happen before that disease occurs. So that is a matter of not having an active lifestyle and access to healthy food. So how can we address that? We want to we want to make sure that we have an, a transportation infrastructure that supports an active lifestyle so that you don't have to separately say, oh, I've got to go to the gym and do something, but that you're actually able to walk, you know, a few blocks away to get your dinner that day or go to the grocery store or run whatever errand you need to run, that it, you do not have to depend on your automobile to do that, but you have the opportunity to take a walk while you're running your errands. I just, you know, how how many people actually have time to just, you know, go to the gym for 45 minutes and, and travel there and back? It's That's a lot harder to fit in than a short walk that you need anyway to, to do something else. Um, and in terms of healthy foods, I think that's, that's a much broader conversation that we can have. But number one is, uh, as policymakers, uh, and we're beginning to do this as a city, is addressing what we call the food deserts in, in our community, where there are you know swaths of land where you can't get a healthy meal. Um, you have to walk, I think, more than a mile, and it's just the access isn't there. So making sure that people have access to healthy foods as well. Anyway, thank you. Uh, we're at the last prepared question. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, child abuse and neglect are serious problems that can have lasting harmful effects on its victims. 
The goal in preventing child abuse and neglect is clear to stop this violence before it even takes place. So what local policies, resources, and efforts will you support to promote safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for all children and families? Um, so child abuse is, uh, I think everyone's read the stories about CPS and how it's underfunded and the terrible heartbreaking stories that come out in the paper uh, when, you know, a child is found or, or several children are found um, in, in neglect or, or under a situation of abuse. And one thing I learned was that there's no parent who, who you know, sets off to abuse their child or to neglect their child. That's Nobody wants to be a bad parent. That it's really the result of when a parent doesn't have a network to rely on, that's when the likelihood of abuse or neglect increases. If you, uh, as, and, and we see that when we have families that move back to San Antonio or, or move back to their hometown because, oh, we're going to have children, we want to be near our parents, and we know that, um, that we need that support in order to, to balance our lives and raise our children in a healthy way. Well, for some people, that's not that's not there. Um, this could happen in the case of teenage pregnancies or when teenagers have multiple pregnancies as well. So one, one way to avoid not having that support network is to make sure we have planned pregnancies and help teenagers avoid uh, having preg unintended pregnancies. Because really, at that age, nobody, you know, nobody's really ready to, to have a family and it's very unlikely that you're going to have a whole network in place and and teen pregnancies are are risky health-wise for the baby and and for the mother so I would say that's that's one tool that that we definitely want to support and use as well as access to to prenatal care that also helps us build um, nurturing relationships thanks Thank you. We're now up for questions from the audience. Does anybody have a question? If you do, you want to come up to the microphone, possibly, to ask your question for Anna Sandoval. Yes, come on over. So you want to say your name, uh, where you're from, or which organization you represent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't live in this district, but I have a lot of family in this district. And, uh, I just have one question. Uh, is, uh, I would like to know if you would look into a critical problem that we've tried to address for many, many years and has fallen on, on uh, deaf ears of those that are, been, that are elected now. And that is, that at one point, um, fluoride was in our water, is in our water. And we fought against that, we voted against it, but they still put it in the water. So uh, many of us have, and in my community, particularly District 5, we don't drink the water, we buy the water. So uh, so we end up taking a bath and washing our clothes with fluoride water. But I would like to uh, all ask if you will look into um, what have been the results. It was intended to um, upgrade or I guess uh, to make it better uh, uh, for tea, for children. But for, it's been, I think it's about over 10 years now, we've been asking for the leadership there to give us a result. Have we really made a change? And then there's a lot of, um, um, I guess, history or uh, that uh, fluoride is really not for us. And there are some uh, fluid neighborhoods like uh, Alamo, Alamo Heights, uh, that they voted to not have the floor anymore. And uh, in other cities, it has been reversed, like in some, uh, San Francisco, they, um, the rest of California, they, uh, they overturned it and they took that uh, floor out of the water. So I think that it, 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 we're talking about health, but I think it's something that needs to be addressed. Are we wasting our money buying this poison that is being put in the water? And if, if, if it is not, well, what are the results? And we need some results. 
or take the fluoride out of the water and stuff, pay the million dollar additional fee. It sounds like that research should be part of the community health needs assessment uh, that is done at the health collaborative and among the community. So are you saying you're you're taking this one and I, <laughs> I was giving you time to think. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Um, so Councilwoman Galvan, uh, thank you for bringing up that very important topic. Uh, I I did come across that same question uh, during my campaigning when I have been block walking. I came across a constituent who. Had had an allergy to um, to fluoride in the water, so she was concerned about it as well, and and said, you know, we really need to to reconsider this. So what I would recommend that that the city do, um, if I'm elected, if and if I'm able to to get the the support of my of my colleagues, is do uh, some research into the, la the later science that has come out regarding the use of fluoride in populations. Uh, there may already be studies that we can look at without having to fund our own study in our own population, and then we can act a lot faster if that information is already out there. Um, I, I think it would be very interesting to do a study in our own population and see what the effect has been. I do know that that's something that would take uh, a much longer time to do and, and probably more money, but I think at the very least, what we can start with is reviewing the science and making a more informed decision at this point in time. So thank you for bringing that up. And a million dollars could be used, uh, <laughs> used in other places if we find that it's not good for health. Thank you. I am assuming maybe she also wanted a commitment uh, from you that you would look into that if elected. Is that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I will look into that if I am elected. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, yes please. Uh, my name is Liz Martinez, and though I don't live in built a house in 1957, and so we have family that's lived in this district, and we need to buy that time. Uh, the health issue that I want to bring up is alcohol consumption. I think that uh, we tolerate a lot, and it takes a lot for families to come to grips with the amount of accepted tolerated. It's affected my family very seriously, uh, contributing enormously to my father's dementia, and uh, as a result of which, I've been able to have a lot of conversations with people who, it turns out, also had alcohol problems in their family. Now, in my father's case, the cops let him drive away because he talked about not giving them tickets. I understand our new police uh, chief has a different attitude, but I don't want it to be a temporary change. I really think that if you look at some of those um, issues having to do with longevity, you'll see that alcohol consumption and I'm just talking about those 12 packs of beers that I was seeing people buying in Walgreens yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, that we really have a community tolerance for a lot of um, uh, recreational drinking. And while we, we scorn the sugary drinks, those big old beers aren't uh, exactly nutritious drinks either. So I'm just saying that in general, from a public health perspective, we have a very <coughs> good party atmosphere for San Diego, but we don't always have let you all look what you have. I mean, so I think that there is a relationship to trauma injury, to dementia, to high blood pressure, and a whole variety of other metabolic diseases. And um, just I think that if it, it is already in the health collaborative agenda, we should at least make sure that it gets uh, some kind of Thank you. So substance abuse and alcohol is part of the community health needs assessment. Um, and we are working on the community health improvement plan right now to develop strategies to address different um, issues that were brought up in the needs assessment. Um, so I, I am 99% sure that there is uh, one group that is working on, uh, one work group that is working on uh, alcohol and substance abuse. Um, but I, I will let it now to Anna to see if you have any comments related to her 
No, I think uh, that's a very good point. You know, when you look at going a bit, going back to the theme of the social determinants of health, one of one of those areas is what is your social and community context? You know, what is acceptable around you? And we have Fiesta coming up. And I'll tell you what's acceptable at Fiesta is a lot of drinking is, is very much acceptable. So I think um, I don't have the solution right now for that. <laughs> uh, uh, but I do think it's going to take some creative thinking about how do we how do we also make it acceptable or just as fun to take part without having alcohol be such a large part of that. Um, and how do we make is this a follow up question? Follow up question because I I can drive myself a but I'm kind of surprised to see that one of the arguments in favor of That's a great point and a great issue, especially to talk about enforcement of those laws. What what policies are out there to address that important issue, and how is it being enforced? Um, I've heard the same argument about, uh, in, in fact, a former mayor, uh, Nelson Wolf, uh, said, you know, we've seen the, the numbers come down on, on DUIs, and definitely saving lives is important, but I think you, you bring up a good point, is we have to go back a little bit further and say, why do we have so many people uh, in that in that situation? Uh, so I think we need to look at our social and community context for for drinking in in San Antonio, especially when it comes to, to having parties. I uh, I am by no means saying I'm outlawing drinking at <laughs> at an event like that, but uh, and making sure that perhaps some kind of maybe your group is working on this already, but. Having individuals recognize those signs of, uh, of overconsumption, when is it not okay? When should we begin to worry about someone's health? And you're right, uh, there are all of these consequ health consequences to, to drinking. For women, more than one, one alcoholic beverage a day, and for men, I believe it's more than two alcoholic beverages a day, comes with the risk of increased heart disease um, and, and many, other, many other diseases. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Yes. Can you double check that the microphone is on, please? Yeah. Hi, my name is Vanessa Rodriguez. Uh, thank you for being here. I think, first of all, that shows um, the importance of, of you being to the table because you know how a voice and what you have to take the right to be representing it. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I just have a question as far as what you would do for advocating as far as funding for community health as compared to other priorities that might be more development or business, um, maybe personal interest kind of thing. So, what would you do as a candidate to help bring that funding to very important issues? Especially regarding social determinants of health, and particularly the mortality rates is something that's uh, near and dear to our community. Um, so I just wanted to see what you do as far as advocating for that. No, thank you for that question. I think. Um, when it comes to advocating for funding, the most important thing a council person can do is show up and be at the table when those discussions happen and to do their homework about what exactly is needed and what benefits that's going to bring. So being able to, to make a, a well-informed case and a persuasive case uh, to, to the fellow council members, I think, is, is number one most important, um, how we can get more funding from our city budget. Um, number two is we also have to 
look at our partners in the community and see what we can do together. Um, so earlier I mentioned all the philanthropic organizations that have a focus on health. So I think working with them is um, should be our first step. But then we have a number of other philanthropic organizations where maybe we can we can persuade or work with them to increase our, our funding for health. For you know, if the city is going to put in this much, what can they bring to the table as as a partnership? And um, I'm with you on infant mortality. Our our numbers are are too high, and um, I did. I did a little project on this in school, actually, for the San Antonio for San Antonio infant mortality to look at what was the biggest risk for that, and the biggest risk is not having access to prenatal care. Um, so, which I probably didn't need to do a whole school project on it. Someone could have just told me, um, but having access to prenatal care and how does that happen? Um, I think it just means we have to be insured because in your first three months of pregnancy, you may not know you're pregnant and you're not going to necessarily seek out prenatal care until you know that you're pregnant. So if you're not, if you're not planning a pregnancy and if you're not seeing your doctor regularly, that leaves you at risk for not getting prenatal care in, in time. So those are, those are very specific things that we should target to, to reduce our infant mortality rate. Related to funding, what do you think about implementing taxes that can help improve neighborhoods in your district or a soda tax? So that's just the idea, but to to bring in more to that that money brings in more money for or generates more money revenue for the city that they, you can use then to more, better improve the health. What do you think about that? Um, sure. I think prior probably to introducing a tax, we might want to find other funding sources that, that we can draw from. Um, uh, maybe if there's, you know, leftover funding from, from a project that, that didn't consume all of its funding, that's probably the first thing that, that we want to do. Um, the second thing I would recommend is before before using the word tax, which <laughs> some people are, are opposed to, is we look at something called a fee. So a fee is actually directly tied. It funds something that's directly tied to what you use. So it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't mean like when you tax, um, if I were to tax a beverage five cents, maybe I could use that money on anything. But if I have a fee that's directly associated with, um, I don't know, maybe perhaps a vending machine that sells that, um, then I, I directly use them or we directly use that money for programs that um, that help us with the impacts of you know of sugary beverages. We've seen this happen with we've seen this happen with cigarettes. And, and it works. So I think we do need to consider doing this with um, not just sugary beverages, perhaps, but, but exactly, but other, other ingestibles that, that contribute to, um, to poor health. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, I'm Kimberly Marshmallow, and I um, represent along with my friend Carmen uh, <coughs> okay. um, um, We are part of Jefferson United Methodist Church in this neighborhood, and um, I guess my question is twofold. Um, I'll start with the whole county issue, because we do pay a county's hospital tax here, and that was designed a long time ago to provide for the health of this county. Um, and then also, there's a bunch of decisions that are made at the Austin level by for-profit companies that control our children's mental health and our elder care and, and some of those issues. And so, uh, what would you see as a council person as your ability to break down some of those long-held territorial and, and worked all together? Um, that's my first question. 
So recently, our our uh, sitting council person did take a bus of people to, to lobby day in Austin. I think something uh, like that needs to be multiplied tenfold. You know, we don't need to do it on just one day, and we don't need to do it with just one council person. We need all of us together on the same page, uh, and that is, and even not just our council persons, but what about in Houston or Dallas where we're facing the same problems? There are cities throughout. Texas that they're facing the same problems with the legislature and I think it is time to create a network with them where we can actually have some influence at the legislative level so that's that may sound like pie in the sky to some people but I think we need to think big because there's a lot we can do at the local level but we could do so much more if we had partners in Austin yeah, I, I agree and I think when we talk, start talking about revenue streams to call back the ones that are already there <laughs> is really important. But the other part of my question is, you know, we have, I mean, this church obviously is very active in the community. We have lots of churches. We have excellent yoga instructors. We've got the Jefferson Outreach for older people here in this area. There's a lot of different um, ways that organizations can be tied together. And how would you see that the city council as a whole could identify organizations that can work together to address the needs. Thank you, Kimberly. I think uh, we already, we do have a Department of Human Services in, in the city is my understanding. Uh, so I would want to ensure that that, that, that department is well versed with uh, the community organizations that we have that provide services and make that information available to the constituents. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, I attended a neighborhood association meeting a few months ago in Culebra Park, and uh, some of the residents were concerned about how their, how their elders could stay in their homes if you know now they needed a wheelchair ramp or uh, needed some home repairs. And fortunately, because I had been on a, on the Area Foundation's grant committee for, for senior services, I, I was aware of organizations that did that. But that's a very lucky experience that I had. You know, how do we make sure that information is easily available to residents? So, you know, I, I ended up calling back this woman and, and gave her a phone number, and, and hopefully she was able to, to follow up and get the ramp built that, that she needed in her sister's house. But I do. I do see a need for making that information easily available to residents, whether that's, uh, and I think that's something that's that's a perfect fit for a council person who's supposed to be in touch with, with their constituents and making the, the community's resources available to them. So that could be, um, you know, by either hosting town fo forums, uh, town halls, uh, by snail mail newsletters, or by electronic newsletters as well for starters. Um, Maybe if we're able to build a partnership with Nowcast SA, we can uh, feature we can feature you know small segments on public access television highlighting what all of these programs do. You know if we could do yeah, a couple a week, maybe we could cover quite a few over time. But we need to find how um, what are the ways people get their information and how can we tap into that instead of just sitting back and expecting them to, to come to us. So I think the city does does have a role to play in making that information available. So thank you for, for bringing that up. My list of commitments is growing as we speak. That's why we have these types of events, right? Uh, so I have two questions for you. The first one, have you ever heard of the Community Health Bridge? No, so it's a tool. I'm promoting the Health Collaborative. I'm sorry, I'm biased. So the Community Health Bridge is a tool uh, developed in the last six years uh, in line with the Health Collaborative. And it's actually a, like a website and an app with all these resources available in the community uh, on any topic possible, housing, uh, elderly assistance, uh, uh, transportation, uh, family planning, anything uh, you want. So 
we are also looking for feedback on that tool. So communityhealthbridge.com in case you want to look it up and then send us an email about it. So, so if as a councilwoman you could help to promote that because it is free, it is available to the, the entire community, we would appreciate that. Uh, so you know what, maybe that's something that we can commit to even sooner. Uh, I don't see my campaign manager, but maybe we can put that on our campaign website. Sure, is, thank you. Is a link to that, or even at least on our Facebook page. Thank, thank you. you. And my se can I ask my second question? My second question was, how do you plan on being available to your constituents, to the people you represent in your district, if and when you are elected. Um, thank you. That is one thing that uh, that I've thought of a lot, and I've gotten some input from my team as well as the people that I've met along the way. So I'm definitely open to more input on this. Um, but number one is we want to make sure it's easy for constituents to access the the elected official. So I'd like to host regular office hours in the evening, not just during the day, but in the evening where working families uh, can access them. So it's not necessarily at City Hall uh, or the field office, but maybe a more public location that's easy to find. Um, I'd also like to have drop-in office hours so that you don't have to schedule a meeting in advance, but because, um, you know, there are glitches when, when you do that sometimes, but where you could just drop in. Uh, maybe it's not a full half-hour meeting, but you do get some face time, maybe about five minutes or, or ten minutes, enough to convey your concern. And, and sometimes email just doesn't let you express what you want to express or a phone call doesn't let you do that and the truth is some people are more comfortable talking face to face than they are via email and and via phone so we want to we want that to be an option for constituents um, number two uh, I do want to host regular town hall meetings where I tell you what I've been up to what's coming up down the line and uh, and hear what people are concerned about, what's out there on the streets. If I could, I would block walk through the whole through the whole term if I had time to do it because that is actually how I'm hearing the most uh, the most nuanced concerns by individual. Um, so th those are a couple of ways that we've thought about uh, in addition to to simply being present at me at at events that are important to the community where people can see me and. Feel comfortable coming up to me. The, the last thing I would want is for people to feel like they can't just come up to me and talk to me. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Ortega Scully, uh, founder of Less Smiles, Less Ride. No, Less Ride. Uh, yeah, how, how, do you want to come up and ask your question, please? Yeah, you? Uh, ah. Okay. And you can tell uh, us a little bit uh, about um, the coalition, too, if you want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was actually just going to comment on your question. Actually, the city just, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, I went to a, a meeting that the Council of Mayors was having with the Council of Mayors and the Council of Mayors. And they had that their uh, a city put it together, or a city of San Antonio is called City for Good, or City of Good. And what they're trying to do is, what they're wanting to do is get all different congregations together so that people can start uh, sharing their resources. Uh, but anyway, I think it's actually on all of them called City for Good. Um, and it just, we just started this about two weeks ago. Uh, City. Yes. So, Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Why, that makes a lot of sense why you wanted to say it. <laughs> Thank you. We can, perfect. Wonderful. Not yeah. cast to say, thank you. Good comment. Vince. Vince Fonseca, everybody. Doctor. How would you commit, or what would you commit to, 
to relaying back your perspective on whatever it is that citizen spoke. The citizens are bringing up their problems, their concerns, we never ever hear anything back. So when you have people showing up, I sure would like to see every council person and the mayor saying, this is what I think on that topic related to you, my boss, the council. Thank you. I've heard the same concerns about that part of the that part of the agenda called citizens to to be heard. I think um, I would actually even backtrack and say maybe that's not the only way in which we take public input, but there there could be other ways to do it too. Um, submissions online. I would also be open to making those comments that are submitted public, so that your peers also know what what questions are being asked, I, I would be, as a citizen, curious to know, okay, what, what types of questions are being asked, what types of comments are being made on this particular uh, issue. So when I worked, uh, and I, when I worked at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, it was a regulatory agency, uh, we developed clean air rules that affected uh, industrial sources, generally. That rulemaking process included uh, issuing a draft of the regulation and a report that went with it, and it was out for comment for some time. And all the comments were listed in the final report, and there was a response to every single comment in the final report. So not only was there accountability, but there was transparency in that accountability. So I that did take a lot of resources, obviously, but I think it also helped us do a better job, a more thorough job, uh, by understanding the concerns of the stakeholders and making sure we had addressed them. So I think you bring up a very good suggestion. Um, I will certainly consider doing that in my office uh, if, if I'm elected, is having a response response to the comments made at Citizens to be Heard. Thank you. And it also means that you know what the issues are, right? And you can better advocate for them when it comes directly from the community. Any other questions? I'm waiting for one from Dr. Santos in the front about mental health, anything? <laughs> So, my name is Octavio Santos, I uh, work at the VA right now. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to ask you was, uh, yeah, specifically related to mental health, if you have considered any uh, programs that can make actually a, a big impact in terms of uh, mental health care. And, um, and also, I wonder what kind of challenges you, you think you're going to face once you are elected. And obviously, you have heard a lot of different concerns. And I obviously feel overwhelmed just by hearing them. I'm thinking, how, how can, you know, <clears throat> to be elected and realistically, you know, uh, address them. So, I just wanted kind of to add that are there any, I guess, specific plans that you think are going to be the most impactful? that you think that I focus on this because I think that by doing that I can, you know, address chronic diseases, etc. etc. Et Thank you for, for simplifying that because I too was beginning to feel overwhelmed <laughs> by by all the questions. But um, I would imagine I would, of course, rely on, on the great staff of the, at the city to, to help uh, make these things happen and, and hope to have their collaboration in doing so. Uh, but in terms of health and all the other things that, that I want to address as a councilwoman, it's probably my number one focus would be pedestrian infrastructure so that people can move around safely uh, and have access to to get to work, to get to the clinic, to get to the pharmacy, um, to have exercise, but also to have the freedom of moving around uh, if, if you're not able to drive a car, having that, uh, that independence to get yourself somewhere. And as long as we have a strong pedestrian infrastructure and a good public transportation system, to me, those things can improve quality of life in so many many ways, not just health, but access to work, access to education, access to your loved ones, uh, if you can do that. So that 
that would be my, my primary focus is uh, pedestrian infrastructure and uh, as well as access to good public transportation. So thank you. And taking a walk is great for mental health as well. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us kind of what differentiates you between your other candidates and your school club? Just for those that might not be familiar with the other candidates and kind of your stance uh, thank you for that question. It gives me a, a direct opportunity to, <laughs> to campaign, I guess. Uh, so I'll, I'll just give a little bit more of my background and say how that is how that is actually very different from that of the of the other individuals in this race. Uh, so I was raised here in District Seven, uh, like I mentioned, down the street on Donaldson Avenue, and, and attended public schools here. Um, I live where I grew up right now. I live next door to my parents. I not long um, I bought the house next door to theirs. It was a fixer upper and I like to joke that it's still a fixer upper um, right now. So I am um, I have seen where our community was, you know, twenty five years ago and I see what's what things have gotten better, worse, and what things have stayed the same. Um, very much where, where I lived and how San Antonio has grown and how some of that growth, uh, our community hasn't always benefited from it. Um, so I would say I have a very personal tie to, you know, to at least this part of of the district. Um, so number one, that that's one thing that's, that's different. Um, number two is I'm not, um, I'm someone who has over 10 years of experience in public service, in government, uh, and I've served that here in San Antonio and outside of San Antonio. So I think that makes me familiar with the, with the issues here, the resources we have here, the partners that we have here, but it also means that I've seen other things in other places, and I've seen things that don't work, and I've seen things that do work, and, and I'm ready to bring the, the better ones home and try them out. You know, we to make progress, we do have to be a little bit innovative, and we have to take risks, and we have to try things, and I'm, I'm someone who's willing to do that. Um, and number three, the other thing that really differentiates me from the other candidates is I have a very different academic and, and professional background. Um, I have a background in engineering, so I am very analytically driven, and I have a background in civil and environmental engineering and in environmental epidemiology so that um, when you when you look at the experience and the background that I have direct experience in transportation direct experience in environmental quality and direct experience in public health um, those are all very important issues in San Antonio and I'm someone who's worked on all of them on the ground uh, so I, I think that's how I would summarize my the difference between myself and and the other candidates thank you good question anybody else Dying question, that's it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Anna Sandoval, very much. Thank you to everybody for being here today, for participating. I also want to thank uh, NAUCAS, SA, for being here, and for the Bear County Medical Society for preparing the questions today. Before we leave, I just want to let you know that early voting starts next Monday, so if you are planning on doing that, you have until Monday to May 2nd and then voting the actual election day is May 6th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. so you can uh, go to your uh, polling site and go vote for your choice whoever you choose for District 7 so thank you everybody have a good evening